Hello and welcome to the Small Business Briefing. I'm Brian Kelly, the CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Sarah Miller, Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Communications. And so, Brian, we've invited our colleague Kelly Saunders to join us today so the two of you can have a discussion about last night's State of the State address. Yeah, we had that uh, state of the, the state of the state address which was yesterday. It was last night, and of course, as Bam was was uh, was on on hand there, Kelly and I, and also Jacob Manning, our grassroots coordinator, were all in the Capitol for the state of the state address. And uh, our board chair, Sue Tellier, the chair of the board of directors of SBAM, was was seated on the floor for the um, for uh, for the speech, which is uh, something that is pretty pretty common. The SBAM board chair normally does uh, have an opportunity or an invitation to, to be a, a part of that. So, Kelly, a couple a couple of things. I'll talk through a bunch of issues, but I'm maybe I'll start with a um, kind of an overarching thing, thing uh, which was that um, the, the speech didn't really um, have a, a lot of like new hard hitting things. That there weren't like big uh, propo dramatic proposals that were like, whoa, where'd that come from? It, it did seem to be um, uh, a lot of kind of recovering um, and maybe repackaging of some ideas that are already out there. Um, and then a little bit, a few things that were missing were uh, a little bit conspicuous in their absence. Um, but uh, but also I I was kind of expecting more of a national message, you know, as, the, as Governor Whitmer's taken on much more of a, a national profile. Uh, we've seen her give speeches last summer at the end, you know, like the what's next speech uh, seemed to, to be kind of aimed at a, a national audience. I was sort of expecting that yesterday, but really I didn't get the impression that it was a national audience. This is really Michigan based stuff um, aimed at a, at a Michigan based uh, audience. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, always good to be on the briefing, by the way. Uh, and last night was, was very interesting. Uh, Governor Whitmer in the past has been, um, you know, what we think, thinking a little bit bigger. But um, she was definitely focused on um, the success of the Detroit Lions. She was decked out in her Detroit Lions gear, and there were many references to it. Um, but she was very focused on maybe, um, to your point, repackaging uh, some items that are not done yet that she wants to advance, things that she's put on the table before and accelerating um, the achievement of uh, those benchmarks ahead of schedule. And, um, you know, for us, we're kind of okay with not some new <laughs> brand shiny, you know, new objects to chase. It's nice to have a little bit of, um, stability in the system and to know what we're dealing with so that when we're advocating for our policy stances with the legislature um, it provides just that that stability that we like to see yeah that's a good point we don't necessarily like it when the political people throw a bunch of stuff against the wall see if that's you know, it's better sometimes less is more and when it comes to government less is usually more so but let's talk about some of the few things in the address that um that would be more relevant the sort of things that are a part of our uh, agenda or topic areas that we pay uh, close attention to. So um, the governor um, laid out a uh, a, uh, a vision, I guess, or at least some some metrics, some expectations, and in, in the area of housing. So um, the statewide housing plan uh, suggests that we're a couple hundred thousand single-family unit, units short of what we really need in Michigan. That our housing stock is quite old. You know, the average age of a house is over 50 years old in Michigan, which makes it one of the older uh, states for housing stock. And so uh, the governor did uh, suggest that um, that some resources be put toward, I think, revitalization. Yes, um, it's actually quite a big investment. I believe the largest that Michigan would put forward in making an investment in this piece of infrastructure, 1.4 billion is what she's calling upon. And this would be um, basically, to your point, the entire stock of housing, not just single family homes, it would be apartments, you know, the whole gambit. And uh, what would make up of that is to build new, but also rehab uh, current uh, homes that are on the market. And so this essentially the 1.4 billion, um, what she was saying in her speech would, would you know, 10,000 new homes, essentially. We've talked about that um, on the briefing, but also when we've been out in communities that um, it's really hard to attract and retain talent. People want to 
you know, technically live close to where they work. And some communities are just not equipped in order to have new people move into those communities, um, specifically with the Ford deal in Marshall. That community was very, you know, forthright that they did not have the housing stock in order to have that amount of people come into their communities. And so uh, this focus on housing seems timely. It, uh, it was a big piece of our legislative agenda in the last couple years. And so I think for us, this is welcome uh, to see this on the docket. And we'll see how you know the mechanisms work in, in order to fund this and what comes with it. But uh, a message on housing, that's, that's a good note in our book. Yeah, and, they, and, uh, and while there wasn't really, like where does the, the 1.4 billion um, come for? I, I think that there was at least an indication that these are, uh, that we're talking about existing uh, resources, some uh, maximizing uh, some federal housing dollars and, um, and things that could happen through NISHTA. Uh, 10,000 um, units, you know, 1.4 billion, so you do the math, it's 140,000 per unit. So you know it's, you know, you don't build new houses these days for 140,000, so you know that would that would include some rehab, it would have to include multifamily, and that's just kind of averages out. Um, but more to come on that. Now, the way this works, so the governor goes to the state of the state, and then a few weeks later, two or three weeks later, uh, she'll unveil the budget, and then the budget will show kind of how all this fits in um, in the plan. So housing, um, we'll put that on the on the on the good side, the good uh, column at, at this point. And then um, how about um, early childhood education? So this was one of those planned leaks uh, ahead of time, ahead of a speech like this. Normally, uh, governor's office will give the, the media some advance, you know, a few issues. And this was one of the ones that was uh, was uh, a, a planned uh, leak, but pretty pretty vague. And I think you've chased down some extra details on this. What uh, early childhood education? What should we expect? Yes, um, this ties in numerous things we've talked about before, but we are fortunate to have really good relationships um, within the administration. If you recall, we've talked about uh, the new department that was created by the governor last year called MyLeaf. And I really believe, and I think you do too, Brian, that um, you know that creation of that new department did ruffle some feathers in some spaces, but we saw it as maybe a, a benefit to focusing on, you know, childcare and, and early education. Um, and Michelle Richard, who used to work in uh, alongside the governor within her office, was named acting director of that department. And we've had a, a great relationship with her. This is accelerating um, the governor's plan for pre-K for all from 2026 to achieve that goal by the end of 20. 24. And that is a, a big leap. And so, um, no pun intended with my leap, but um, asking that department to really accelerate and um, to remove some barriers, um, specifically in the income eligibility space. This plan that my leap is putting together would essentially remove that barrier for all families in order to access the, the GSRP, Great Start Readiness Program, um, facilities, but also um, in a call today, which we, you know, again, we enjoy a good relationship, we were invited to hear what that roadmap looks like. And so they did a study, which will be released next week, and it focuses on data, where are those four-year-olds, you know, located, why are they not accessing uh, current programs, are current programs in communities even available to take four-year-olds? But also evaluating, do parents, do families want to access this resource anyway? We know that some people choose to use home-based um, uh, resources for their children, and how are we not ostracizing, and for our part, putting smaller businesses, childcare centers out of business if four-year-olds are taken, you know, essentially out of those um, different organizations and put into a more uh, school setting, if you will. So um, while I think there's many things that'll be uncovered next week in this report, and we will be watching it very closely, we wanna make sure that our small business owners that are involved in this space are not losing their livelihoods at the cost of this program. And so um, we remain optimistic about our partnership and how we can feed into the system in this space. Um, and it was revealed to us that this will be a key part of the governor's budget presentation, uh, this roadmap. 
uh, once it's released. And so uh, we'll be at the at the front lines of that, uh, looking forward to the engagement and hoping that we can have some good outcomes in this space. Yeah, so it's an area that could then uh, could could be good, but we've got a um, you know the details around this will matter uh, quite a bit. Just as a reminder, SBM does have a uh, a policy for expanding early childhood uh, education as part of our uh, K-12 agenda that kids go into school prepared and ready to learn. Um, although our, our position would be that having some form of income eligibility might make sense. For example, uh, the Kelly family does not need, uh, you know, does not need a government subsidy for such things. But, um, but then you, you bring up an interesting, um, an interesting point uh, in that there are a lot of providers for childcare. And even if you might, People might be tempted to say, well, but wouldn't it be better to have those kids in a school setting? But school is not all day and school is not year round. And so if you if you change the financial model around early childhood education by taking these more four year olds kind of out of the mix. And so, yeah, it might be good that they're in a program like Great Start Readiness, but it might uh, create a scenario where the availability of child care when Great Start Readiness isn't. Um, operating the times of year, times of day when they're not operating, um, those uh, private sector options might go away. So the idea of, of, of ensuring that uh, that those types of um, smaller daycare uh, center and providers have an opportunity to provide um, preschool education uh, within their licenses might be a good um, good thing for us to track down. Well, and I will say during this time in the, on the call today, that was echoed through many different stakeholders were the, at the table. And so it, I took heart that, you know, we're not going to be alone in, in having that discussion. And I will say the director and her team were very open to having that conversation and that partnership about making sure that, you know, we're not ostracizing anyone. And so we'll take them at their word that, you know, they want to do that. And um, they did say that the governor's budget presentation will be February 7th. And so we'll learn more at that time too. And we obviously watch that process very closely as well. Good. And, and of course, longtime viewers of the program might may or may not remember that both Emily Laidlaw and Michelle Richard have uh, have been guests on this briefing. And um, we enjoy a, a, a good, our organization, a, a close relationship and friendship with uh, with that team. All right, let's talk about um, economic development. So this was an area that the um, that the governor spent a little bit of time on. I think it was toward the end of the um, of the policy proposals um, in between the um, maybe a little awkward uh, song references. There was a, a theme of 80s uh, music that um, maybe didn't land the right way. But anyway. Uh, no. In between all that, there are these policy uh, issues. The um, and uh, and there were several. It seemed to be several components to it. What uh, what's the economic development vision? Well, to be fair, you are a music aficionado, so I think this maybe hit home for you a little bit closer than most. But um, you know, maybe you can text or call the governor and and, and go through that with her. So, um, yes, on economic development, uh, we obviously like to be at the forefront on this is issue too. There were a couple of pieces that came out of uh, the Michigan House of Representatives before the end of the year that we were engaged on, specifically uh, the the research and development t uh, tax credit. And um, we have a couple of different business organizations that we work closely with, uh, Business Leaders for Michigan, uh, Michigan Manufacturers Association, Detroit Regional Chamber, to name a few, that were really interested in making sure that this tax credit was agnostic, that our members would be able to access it, that it would be easy um, when you file your taxes and immediate through Treasury. And so we were able, at the end of the day, specifically in the House of Representatives, to get our, you know, our wants and our needs in that bill, and it was passed out. It's currently sitting in the Senate right now, where there might be a couple obstacles, but we feel confident um, in our advocacy that we can, you know, make sure that they know that they, this doesn't need to be touched. It's been formulated in the right way and get it over the finish line, which would be a really nice way for us um, to have a win with the administration and to have one with the legislature as a whole too. So uh, we'll be working on that. Uh, the next piece was called Hire Michigan, uh, which is essentially a recreation of Governor Snyder's uh, good jobs package from years ago, reviving that. Um, and that um, is, is not really 
that's in the front stages of, of where it needs to be. One other piece that was passed uh, before the end of last year was Renaissance Zones. Um, that's currently sitting in the Senate as well. And the last one is an innovation fund. And so the governor was really pushing these key uh, four pieces to get over the finish line in both houses. It does have bipartisan support um, in theory <laughs> in both in both chambers. Uh, we obviously are experiencing a little bit um, of a budding of heads right now with the House being split 54-54. We've talked about those special elections. Um, actually, the the primary is next week for those two uh, seats in Westland and Warren and the general election um, in April, where we perceive that the Democrats will have control over the House again. Not that they don't right now. It's just we're in a holding pattern, if you will. So, um, you know, we will seek to be involved in this process. We care about economic development, uh, but the R&D tax credit could be a real game changer for our membership. Yeah, that's one where, um, you know, the goal is to just really just keep it in a way that is accessible to, to small businesses and not have them get into the business of picking who does, you know, what type of research and development is worthy um you know you were that industry agnostic that's what we're talking about there that we see how we don't want the government to say well we'll do r d for this industry but not for that industry it should be really available for for all industries uh, who are engaging in uh, research and development the um the uh fire which is the uh, kind of a reprisal of the um the good jobs program from before you know that one is um i think the details might be interesting it could be it could be totally irrelevant to us in other words it's a big business thing but the threshold on how many jobs you have to create in order to get in uh, the mix what it is is a tax capture uh, mechanism where uh in, if somebody were to hire people and they in their average wages are above the median uh for the county depending on what percentage above the median some of the withholding taxes that you'd normally send for the state income tax, the employer could keep as an incentive to provide those jobs. It's just it's kind of a um, layman's, a little more complicated than that, but that's basically how it works. And um, and so if it's like the sort of thing where you have to hire a lot of employees at one time, then well, it's not going to be accessible to small businesses. But maybe if they're willing to lower that threshold, it could be um, relevant to some of our members. That innovation fund to, to fund like startup, um, that that was the only one that I, first of all, I didn't, I, I didn't perceive, I didn't hear anything about that ahead of time. I heard about all the other ones, but not, not that one. And that one is the one that seems the most um, strange to me, you know, like what it, like how, how big would a fund have to be in order to kind of make a dent, first of all, but then are there people in state government that know how to pick which startup ideas should get startup capital from the government. It, it's just that yeah. that capital question is maybe a little complicated. To... I also think it might be a little bit of a pivot away from the SOAR fund that we talked about before. The governor has been pretty intent in, in making some changes to that and the Senate has wanted to go in a different direction um, than she has. And so I, I want, I think that again, just reading, you know, being a part of this this atmosphere and seeing how things work, I, I do think that this was another uh, tool in her toolkit, if you will, from an economic development standpoint that pivoted away from what has become kind of a um, tough topic uh, between the governor's office and the legislature. And I do want to build on the, the Higher Michigan, Brian. I think we will obviously be paying attention to this package as a whole, but that specific piece, the way the governor's office is, um, uh, messaging it is that this helps small and second stage companies and so um, I think you and I are our radar go up and say we'll be the judge of that and so we need to really see the details to see um, how how we could engage in that process because what we had seen prior to 2024 in the fall did not really meet the needs of what our membership would need so we'll uh, we'll be tracking that and see if that messaging lines up with what we're seeing in the actual bill drafts yeah, there you know, there's so much goodwill across the landscape for small business that it's not unusual to hear people say this is for small business, but that is it really relevant for small right. business? And that, yeah, that's kind of an open question that we did. You know, it was in the uh, it was in the talking points, but um, but we'll have to follow up on the on the details. Let's finish up uh, with uh, well, actually, I'll just mention there was also a little bit of discussion on roads. 
but basically it was I've told the department to do the last round of borrowing um, for the uh, bonds that were authorized back in 2019. So nothing really new on roads. Uh, there was uh, a decision in 2019 to borrow some additional money for M roads and I roads. So like the state and the federal trunk lines. Um, so the last tranche of that borrowing, um, she has told the department to do, which was scheduled for this year anyway. So nothing really new there. Um, let, let's finish up with what was what was conspicuous in its absence in the speech? Well, I mean, numerous things. And I dare not say them out loud because I don't want them to come to fruition necessarily. Um, you know, in the what's next speech that was back in August, uh, the governor was pretty intent on paid leave. And I think that we were all kind of bracing ourselves for, you know, us here to, for that. And that was um, not said whatsoever. Now, there was a study commissioned in the last budget um, on paid leave specifically. And, um, you know, we've heard rumblings that they're kind of waiting on that study to make a decision on how they move, move forward on it. We know that there are still proposals being circulated in the House and the Senate um, about what that could look like. We are vehemently opposed to everything that we've seen, you know, thus far. So uh, while we're glad we didn't hear it, we still are a little, you know, we're in anticipation of what's of what is to come on that front. Yeah. So what really could um, uh, could have come up now? Maybe you know what? Well, maybe lame duck would be the the concern. So yeah, the family medical leave, that fifteen week paid leave benefit. Um, didn't come up. Uh, unemployment extensions didn't yeah. come up. Um, this idea of um, of allowing local governments to set minimum wages higher than the state's uh, overall minimum wage or otherwise establish um, local labor laws um, didn't come up. So yeah, there are a lot of things that we were that we would have been concerned about that have come up in the past that didn't come up here, uh, which I think is just a sign of the times. So legislature right now that divided uh, uh, membership of 54-54 in the House elections are this year, presidential exactly. elections this year, all that stuff uh, may be taking the foot off the gas. So Kelly, as usual, thanks for keeping track of all of this. And um, I know that we'll, uh, we'll have many, many updates on this stuff as we go through the process. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, thank you both. That was a really thorough uh, recap of the speech from last night. And I know um, very much appreciated by viewers and members. We do have a couple other topics to discuss today. Brian, can you explain what's happening um, with the U.S. Supreme Court and redistricting? Yeah, we had talked about the uh, the redistricting commission had asked for the um, the U.S. Supreme uh, Court, the you know the the one in Washington. So we got a state Supreme Court, but the, you got the federal Supreme Court. Um, they had asked the federal Supreme Court to stay the requirement or to pause the requirement that they draw new maps. And I'd said before, I would be absolutely shocked um, if uh, if they were successful in that. And they were not successful. In that. So um, this uh, Sixth Circuit um, Court of Appeals is in the jurisdiction of, uh, of Brett Kavanaugh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh, and um, and uh, Kavanaugh did deny the stay request, which means the maps will continue to be drawn. Now, what it doesn't mean is that it's over. The redistricting commission can still appeal to the, the state Supreme Court or the federal Supreme Court. Um, I don't, I'd be surprised. It would be a total waste of everybody's time if they did. But the, um, because that's a foregone conclusion what the answer is. The court, the U.S. Court of Appeals has such an, um, you know, such a uh, an airtight type uh, decision that it would just be inconceivable almost for the U.S. Supreme Court to disagree. But the only thing that was denied here was the stay. Uh, so, in other words, um, the uh, they're still they can still do a full appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court can still reject that appeal. But in the meantime, if they do that, the U.S. Supreme Court is not going to um, overrule the. Um, the Court of Appeals, which means the maps will continue to be drawn. It also means that at least one Supreme Court justice is of the opinion that those who were appealing, asking for the stay, the Citizens Redistricting Commission, are not likely to um, are not likely to um, 
prevail on a um, on an appeal. So it's a it's just a sign that it's uh, it's over. So redistricting uh, that there are a few um, uh, potential maps that have been um, have been out there. Michigan State University got involved and suggested a few to the the commission and done um, <clears throat> at least a hearing uh, in Detroit. So uh, that process is uh, is underway, and I expect that court actions notwithstanding, um, that by the time we get to August primaries that in Southeast Michigan that probably in the House right now, not the Senate, just in the House, um, you'll probably see a good, you know, 10 to 15 maps that uh, are uh, legislative districts that have different boundaries. All right. Well, thanks for the update there. Finally, let's talk about the presidential election, the race, um, you know, primaries are, are happening right now. Um, President Biden picked up a new endorsement. And on the Republican side, the battlefield has shifted to South Carolina. So what's the latest? Yeah, and the uh, the endorsement was one that was kind of long anticipated and that the president would normally be able to take for granted, but um, it was the UAW. So you know, UAW had a new leader. That new leader had withheld the endorsement of the UAW of uh, President Biden's reelection because um, because they um, there's this transition ha happening to electric vehicles, and um, and there's a lot of a, a lot of uh, UAW workers that could potentially be out of work because of that. So this idea of a just transition, um, and I don't you know I don't know exactly what that. This is something that they were looking for signals from the administration to say, as you incentivize this transition, make it you know between regulations and taxes, uh, to say you know to kind of push the market in that direction. How are you going to protect uh, American auto workers? So apparently they've been satisfied that they have an answer on that, and um, and so that endorsement just came. Um, so there is no credible opposition with within the Democratic primaries. Um, Joe Biden will. Um, uh, will receive that nomination. On the um, on the Republican side, the uh, the New Hampshire primary just happened. The next one up is um, is uh, South Carolina. Now um, it was I, I think the margin between uh, the two remaining Republican main Republican candidates being uh, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. I think the margin about eight percent. So it was you know it was a a wide um, enough victory for. Um, uh, for President Trump, but it's a, um, but it's a, uh, not quite as wide as what you know a lot of the other uh, states uh, are polling. Now, what makes South Carolina kind of interesting is that uh, Nikki Haley used to be governor of South. She was a very popular governor of South Carolina, but the makeup of the Republican primary voters in that state look nothing like New Hampshire. So New Hampshire has. Um, has a makeup that would maybe favor a candidate like uh, Nikki Haley a little bit more. And so even though she was the governor there, um, the way at least the way polling is um, is shaping up, uh, it, it looks like it will not be as close a race in um, in South Carolina. Now, you know, there's still some time and maybe, uh, maybe that could change before the date uh, rolls around, but a rematch of 2020 is looking increasingly likely. All right. Well, on that note, we are adjourning for the day. We will be back here on Monday at 3 p.m. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. See you on Monday.